It's an honor for me to address this August gathering. I would like to express profound gratitude to the Honorable Chief Justice of Pakistan for hosting this event. I'm grateful to the Honorable Prime Minister for according high priority to the issue of alarming population growth, which is reflected by his presence amongst us today. We all agree that alarming increase in population is considered a major hindrance in the way of economic development of a country. In a country where we are combating economic challenges and water scarcity, unchecked population increase has already eaten into the modest economic gains made in terms of socioeconomic development. In such a scenario, this forum is indeed need of the hour as only concerted collective efforts can pull us out of this situation. I'm confident that this forum will guide us in devising a roadmap for action and lead to concrete outcomes. I would like to make special mention of the technical session held in the morning on the advice of the Honorable Chief Justice Pakistan as part of this national symposium, which was well attended with participation of leading national and international lights in the field of population planning who provided useful input in charting the way forward. Moses Khawatino Hazrat, Abadi mein khatarnaak hat tak izafe ko insani hukuk ke masle ke tanazur mein dekhte huye Chief Justice Pakistan ne na sirf hum sab ki tawajjo is ahem issue ki jani mabzool karai balke humari rehnumai ke liye aap ki banai hui committee ne nihayati mufid aur kabile amal tajaweez muratab ki hain main wo tajaweez bhi aap ke samne rakhna chahta hu کیونکہ اس پر عمل درامت ہم سب نے مل کر ممکن بنانا ہے تجاویز میں سب سے پہلے وفاقی اور صوبائی سطح پر ٹاسک فورسز کا قیام شامل ہے جو پاپولیشن گروت فٹیلیٹی ریٹ کے کنٹرول اور کانٹرسپٹیف پریویلنس ریٹ کے حوالے سے کیے گئے فیصلوں پر عمل درامت کی نگرانی کرے گی اس کے علاوہ فیملی پلاننگ اور ریپروڈکٹیو ہیل سروسیز کی ہر خاندان تک رسائی کو یقینی بنانا بھی شامل ہے فیملی پلاننگ اور ریپروڈکٹیو ہیلتھ کے حوالے سے ضروری قانون سازی کی تجویز دی گئی ہے جس پر ہم نے کام کا آغاز کر دیا ہے کم عمری میں شادی سے متعلق قانون سازی نکاح نامے میں فیملی پلاننگ کے حوالے سے کاؤنسلنگ اور ماں بچے کی صحت کا بنیادی حق جیسے اہم ایشوز پر قانون سازی کی تیاری کی جا رہی ہے کانٹرسپٹیو کموڈیٹی سیکیورٹی کے حوالے سے کمیٹی کی سفارشات پر عمل بھی ہمارے ایکشن پلان میں شامل ہے جید علماء کرام کا تعاون اس ایشو پر موثر آگہی مہم اور اس کو کریکلم اور ٹریننگ کا حصہ بنانے بنانا سفارشات اور ہماری حکمت عملی کا بنیادی حصہ ہے میں یہاں یہ ذکر ضروری سمجھتا ہوں کہ کمیٹی کی تجاویز کے تناظر میں ہماری وزارت نے پاپولیشن اور صحت کے صوبائی وزراء کا اجلاس بلایا جہاں ہم نے ان تجاویز پر عمل درامت کا یقینی تفصیلی جائزہ لیا مجھے یہاں یہ بتاتے ہوئے خوشی محسوس ہو رہی ہے کہ تمام صوبائی وزراء اس اہم ایشو پر ہماری سوچ سے مطابقت رکھتے ہیں انہوں نے آبادی میں اضافے کے اہم ایشو پر حکمت عملی بنانے کے لیے بھی اپنی موثر تجاویز دی ہیں سپریم کورٹ کی کمیٹی کی سفارشات کی توسیق کے بعد آپ نے فوری بنیادوں پر پرائم نیسٹر صاحب نے فوری بنیادوں پر کاؤنسل آف کامن انٹرسٹ کی میٹنگ بلائی جس میں تمام صوبائی وزراء اعلیٰ نے تمام تجاویز کو متفقہ اور اصولی طور پر منظور کیا میں اس احسن اقدام کے لیے وزیراعظم صاحب اور تمام وزراء اعلیٰ کا تہ دل سے مشکور ہوں خواتین حضرات پاکستان دنیا میں آبادی کے تناسب سے چھٹا بڑا ملک ہے اگر اس تناسب سے آبادی بڑھتی رہی تو اگلے تیس سالوں میں ہماری آبادی دگنا ہو جائے گی آبادی میں اضافے کی وجوہات میں آگاہی کی کمی خاندانی منصوبہ بندی کی تفصیلات 
اور سہولیات کا فقدان اور ناشناسائی بنیادی مسئلہ ہے ہمارے ملک میں ماں اور بچے کی شرح اموات میں مسلسل اضافہ صحت کے شعبے کے لیے ایک مستقل چیلنج ہے صحت اور تعلیم کے شعبے میں عدم توجہ ہماری سماجی اور اقتصادی ترقی کے راستے میں رکاوٹ رہی ہے ہم وفاقی وزارت کی طرف سے اس اہم ایشو پر توجہ دلانے کے لیے مختلف سطح پر آگاہی پروگرام شروع کریں گے ہر سطح پر سٹیک ہولڈر سے ایڈوکیسی کریں گے تاکہ اس مسئلے پر تمام طبقہ فکر کو ساتھ لے کر چلا جائے عوام الناس کی آگاہی کے لیے بھی بھرپور انداز میں کیمپین چلائیں گے تاکہ اپنے پیغام کو گھر گھر پہنچا سکیں میں جناب وزیر اعظم پاکستان اور جناب چیف جسٹس پاکستان کو یقین دلاتا ہوں کہ ہماری وزارت تمام سفارشات پر عمل درآمد کے لیے صوبوں کے ساتھ مل کر کام کرے گی اور اس مقصد کے حصول کے لیے بھرپور اقدامات کریں گے آپ کا بہت شکریہ بہت شکریہ زاہد صاحب وی آر دا سکس موسٹ پاپولس کنٹری ان دا ورلڈ اینڈ سم ٹائمز وین وی آر اونلی کنسڈرنگ آر اون کمیونٹیز آر اون نیبر ہڈس مے بی وی آر ناٹ سینگ ہاؤ اٹ افیکٹس آس ایٹ دا گلوبل اسٹیج Our next speaker, ladies and gentlemen, is someone with a lot of insight and uh, a scholar of international repute for this very subject at the Population Council. He was recently also invited at the Vatican by the Pope to discuss the matter of population in the Western world, in Europe, and the Christian world. He joined the Council in 1973 following a postdoctoral fellowship in the population dynamics at the John Hopkins University. It's also very important to see how the world views Pakistan and our population. We want to make the most of this dividend of a youthful population, of a population that has a big component of young children, but are we as a state, as a society, providing them with the best preparation for the world of tomorrow? Speaking on the subject of the new demographic realities of Pakistan, please join me in welcoming the Vice President and the Distinguished Speaker from the Population Council New York, Dr. John Bongartz. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Uh, Your Excellency, the Prime Minister, Honorable Chief Justice, Honorable Speakers of the National Assembly and Senate, Prime Minister of AJK, Chief Ministers of the Provinces, ladies and gentlemen. As you have just heard, uh, the population of Pakistan has grown very rapidly over recent decades. In 1947, there were 30 million Pakistanis. Today, there are more than 200 million. So that's a six-fold increase. And the projections now indicate that by the end of the century, the population will reach somewhere between 350 and 400 million. Clearly, this is not a desirable trend. And the question then is, what can we do uh, respecting human rights and uh, respecting uh, women's uh, well-being? What can we do about this trend? Um, my assignment here is to review demographic trends and then discuss the role of family planning programs and the multi-sectoral benefits that can be gained from family planning. So let me start with a, a slides. And let me see. Uh, this uh, slide shows the overall trend in population uh, from 1950. Uh, Now, 1950, about 30 million. To today, the recent census indicated that the population is 208 million. The red line then uh, projects the numbers taken from the latest UN projections, and they indicate 352 million. I should mention, however, that this uh, estimate was made two years ago, before uh, the results of the census came in, and before the results of the latest DHS survey came in. And both of these items of information leads me to believe that the projection that the UN will make next will be higher than 352 million and could well be 400 million. 
So imagine what that means. Uh, instead of 200 million, 400 million Pakistanis. Every uh, thing made by man in Pakistan will have to be rebuilt. You have to build every building, every home, every school, every clinic, every road, every bridge that you now have will have to be rebuilt. And if that is somehow managed, uh, you end up with the same quality of life that you have now because there are also twice as many people. Clearly, that's not a desirable investment of resources. So the question is, how can we slow this uh, projection? Uh, I should also mention the next slide. Uh, yeah. Compares the trajectories of Pakistan and India and Bangladesh. And uh, here uh, on this axis, we have the ratio of the population in the future related to today's population. So the top line is Pakistan, uh, which will expect it to roughly double by uh, the year uh, 2100. Instead, if you look at India and Bangladesh, India and Bangladesh, the green and the yellow line, we are expected to grow by 10 or 20% more and then decline. So uh, the growth rate in Pakistan is much higher. Uh, you've heard growth rates. Even a small change in the growth rate has a very large impact on population in the long run. So the question then is, well, uh, why are uh, the trends for Pakistan so different from India and Bangladesh? And the first answer is, next slide. OK. Uh, uh, the first answer uh, in the causal chain is the trend in fertility. Uh, this graph shows the trends in the fertility of women uh, expressed in the number of births per woman from 1950 to today. And uh, looking at the uh, estimates in the 50s and 60s, we see that Pakistan, India, and Bangladesh had very high fertility, roughly six births per woman. Uh, the first country to begin to see a decline was India, the yellow line, uh, in the 70s. And a steady, slow decline leaves India now with about two and a half uh, births per woman. Bangladesh uh, didn't see very much decline in the 60s and 70s, but in the 80s, a very sharp decline began, and it caught up with India uh, in the recent decade. Pakistan's line, the red line, stays high until around 1990, and then begins to decline. And we see a steady uh, difference between Pakistan and India and Bangladesh of about a birth and a half. And that difference of a birth and a half is sufficient to lead to much higher uh, population growth in the long run. So why are fertility trends different? Here, next slide. Here we have the trends in contraceptive use. Um, for all three countries. Uh, back in the 1960s, contraceptive use was almost absent in all three countries, in fact, in all of Asia. In the 1970s, India's uh, contraceptive use levels started rising, but fairly slowly. And Bangladesh, it started in the 80s, uh, and its increase was much more rapid. So Bangladesh has actually overtaken India in terms of contraceptive use. The red line shows Pakistan where relatively little happened until the 80s and the early 90s. Then a slow decline in contraceptive use occurred, and it now stands at about 35. Uh, interestingly, and perhaps worryingly, uh, the rate of contraceptive use in the last few years has leveled off in Pakistan. If this continue, it will be a serious problem for the long run. I'm not sure because sometimes these data have errors, but this is a, a sign that, that should be taken uh, uh, attention to. And the final question is why are contraceptive use levels so different between these countries? And the next slide shows uh, why that is the case. The big blue arrows in these graphs point to the time at which the family planning program began seriously in these countries. So the yellow line, India, they had the first uh, program starting actually in the 60s, but really uh, gearing up in the 70s. 1980, uh, Bangladesh made a big push and uh, invested greatly in a uh, nationwide family planning program. And Pakistan is about a decade later before it began a, a serious investment in family planning program. So in short, investments in family planning 
race contraceptive use, lower fertility, and lower population growth. So the, uh, next, I want to speak briefly about the role of family planning programs and how family planning programs actually affect uh, the uh, contraceptive use level. Uh, family planning programs, of course, provide contraceptive access, they build clinics, they uh, train uh, staff, and the objective of that activity is twofold. First is to reduce the unmet need for contraception, and secondly, providing information to women and couples raise the demand or crystallize the demand for contraception. So these are two separate and very important uh, roles for the program. Uh, let me explain what I mean by unmet need for contraception. Uh, the bottom line here shows the contraceptive use trend uh, for Pakistan, which started at about 10%. 10 of married women used contraception in 1990. That rose to about 30% in 2010 and is leveling off or perhaps declining a little bit. These are women who don't want to get pregnant and are using contraception. But there are many more women who don't want to get pregnant and are not using contraception. And that number is given by the top line. That is called the demand for contraception. That is, the, all women who do not want to get pregnant should be using contraception, but many of them are not. So in 1990, if you compare the blue and the red line, you see that the majority of women who don't want to get pregnant were not using contraception. But over time, the gap between the blue and the red line has narrowed, and uh, that is called the unmet need. So unmet need has come to decline as a result of the uh, efforts made by uh, the family planning program. But uh, there's two things to worry about here. First, unmet need is still high, and secondly, the leveling off of use is largely due to the leveling of the demand for contraception. So this means that it is not just a matter of unmet need, but also of uh, information for women about. Uh, this slide compares Pakistan with India and Bangladesh. So the red part is simply the uh, contraceptive use levels. Contraceptive use in Pakistan is about 34%, in India it's about 60%, and in Bangladesh it is. Now, there's two reasons why Pakistan contraceptive use level is lower than in Bangladesh and India. The first is the blue part, the unmet need, is higher in Pakistan than in India and Bangladesh. So that's an obvious part to work on uh, to uh, reduce unmet need. Secondly, uh, the demand is lower uh, in Pakistan and India and Bangladesh. So in order to catch up to the levels of India and Bangladesh, we need to both work on the unmet need and on uh, the uh, uh, demand for contraception. And finally, I must say, the, reason, uh, the result of the unmet need, if there are women who have an unmet need, that is women who want to avoid pregnancy and are not using contraception, that leads to unintended pregnancies. There are about five million unintended pregnancies in Pakistan every year and about two million abortions. So there's no question that there's a very large amount of unmet need in this country. Uh, finally, a brief look at uh, the benefits of family planning programs. In the past, family planning programs have often been seen as strictly health interventions and as human rights intervention, giving women the right to choose the number and spacing of their children. But there are many more benefits uh, that research has now shown that family planning programs have a wide range of benefits. And next slide. Uh, the benefits are economic, they're in health, they're in human rights, they're environmental, and they're governmental. Let me say a word about each one of them. On the economic front, we have what is called the demographic dividend. Uh, next slide. Yeah. The demographic dividend refers to a boost to the GDP per capita, a boost that can last for decades. Uh, and that dividend has been very clearly uh, demonstrated in Asian the Asian tigers in the 70s and 80s. Taiwan, Korea, Thailand, Indonesia have greatly benefited from their very rapid decline in fertility, and they received a boost uh, to their economy from the program. It's calculated that the return on family planning investment is 120 to 1. That is, $1 invested in family planning programs returns $120 in other sectors. 
And finally, and equally important, uh, reducing fertility reduces unemployment. As you know, uh, Pakistan, uh, about half of Pakistan's population is under age 20. These young people are aging and looking for jobs. Many times these jobs are not available and therefore these youth are unemployed. By reducing fertility, we reduce the number, the demand for jobs and reduce unemployment. Very important. Uh, then uh, the benefits of health, first of all, each pregnancy is associated with a risk to mortality and morbidity. So fewer births means uh, reduced maternal mortality. Improved infant and child mortality, and then of course fewer abortions. As I mentioned, there are two million abortions every year in Pakistan. That is really uh, too much. Uh, human rights. Uh, family planning brings greater freedom to determine the number and spacing of children. Uh, women often do not have this choice right now. On the environment, very important uh, in a country like Pakistan, slower population growth will reduce pressure on natural resources. Water is a very important part, agriculture, energy, and so on. And with fewer people, uh, reduced air, water, and soil pollution. And finally, um, at the governmental level, uh, the government is struggling to provide services, schooling, clinics, roads, etc. With slower population growth, there will be increased resources per capita for schooling, healthcare sectors, and infrastructure. So that makes it possible to improve the quality of education. Uh, here's the, fun. the question then is, well, uh, if we invest in family planning, how much difference does that make to uh, the future population? And this slide uh, gives a partial response to that. The red line is the UN projection, uh, which ends up at around 360 million. Uh, the two blue lines give the high and the low variant. Uh, the high variant reaches about 500 million people, and that is the trajectory that Pakistan is on unless it makes further effort. The lower curve uh, is the low variant, and it means that we have to reduce fertility by half a burst below the current trajectory, which is not difficult with a good program. And in that case, you would end up with a population of about 200 million, or a little bit above 2 million. So adding, uh, slowing down fertility would add 200 million people to the future. Investing in family planning and reducing fertility might uh, reduce uh, the total to 200 million. So clearly, a small change in fertility can have a very large impact on future population. So my conclusion is that Pakistan is expected to grow by about 150 million and possible 200 million by the end of the century. Family planning programs have demonstrated to raise demand and reduce unmet need, and thereby reducing fertility and population growth and substantial socioeconomic, environmental, health, and governmental benefits uh, follow from fertility decline. Uh, finally, a word about uh, policy uh, implications. It's crucial that we recognize the multi-sectoral benefits of family planning and slow population growth. Family planning is not just a health investment. Family planning helps and affects benefits all sectors of the economy. So you have to make family planning a development priority, not just a health priority. Uh, and of course, we have to increase investments in family planning and mainstream family planning in the healthcare sector, which is not the case at the moment. So thank you very much. Let me say in conclusion that I'm, uh, this is an extremely important event uh, for Pakistan. And I believe that uh, the strong attention from the high government officials that population now received will be greatly benefit the population of Pakistan. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bongartz, and for once again reiterating that the alarming growth in population is not just a management issue or an administrative issue, but more a human rights issue and a development priority. You very rightly pointed out that there is, of course, a lesser demand for contraceptives, and there is, of course, that blue part of the graph that reminds us of the unmet need. But we must once again reiterate that the high fertility driving population growth in Pakistan is not completely 
a matter of choice. A huge number of Pakistani couples want to space and limit birth, but unfortunately there's lack of information and lack of access to services. Ek andaze ke mutabik har saal Pakistan mein 90 lakh pregnancies hoti hain. Is mein se 50 lakh pregnancies wanted hain, jabki 40 lakh unwanted hain. Is ke pressure ka andaza karte hue, aapko ye batate chale ki is mein se takriban 22 lakh induced abortions hote hain. Aur iski wo aap misal dekh sakte hain kyunki services up to the mark nahi hoti, ye mazid mother and child mortality rates mein izafa kar raha hai. Is ke ilawa, isi number ko dekhte hue jo 40 lakh unwanted pregnancies hain, 14 lakh unwanted births hoti hain, aur takriban 4 lakh miscarriages hote hain. Ye wo numbers hain that should really be alarming for us. Fikr Angez lamha hai ye humare liye aur isi awale se ek short documentary humne prepare ki hai. We'd like you to take a look at that. Maashi Masai, Khurbat, Kudrati Afad. Ye sab vaakiyat hume chhote lagenge. Agar hume ye pata chal jaye ke Pakistan par sabse badi afad to abhi tooti hi nahi. मेरी शादी को 10 साल हो गए मेरे नौ बच्चे हैं ये सबसे बड़ी बेटी फिजा है उससे छोटा ये अहमद है फिर ये मुस्कान है फिर ये तलहा है फिर ये अलिशबा है फिर ये हिज्जा है फिर दोनों ट्विंस है फिर ये सबसे छोटी है में पाकिस्तान में 20 साल बाद मर्दमशुमारी हुई जिसमें आबादी बढ़ने के तनासब से यह अंदाजा लगाया गया कि 2050 तक पाकिस्तान की आबादी 40 करोड़ तक हो जाएगी सवाल यह है कि क्या पाकिस्तान की जमीन जिसका काबिल काश्त रकबा सिर्फ 39% है इतनी ज्यादा आबादी का बोझ उठा पाएगी या नहीं चलो आप देखें ना पीने को पानी नहीं है बिजली नहीं है तो यह तो खाने को राशन नहीं है बाहर से हम सारी चीजें मंगाते हैं प्यास तक हम बाहर से मंगा लेते हैं ये कर लेते हैं तो ये तो एग्रीकल्चर लैंड खत्म होते जा रही है और शहरों की आबादी में इजाफा होता जा रहा है शहरी हदूद बढ़ती जा रही हैं तो ये तो फिर एग्रीकल्चर लैंड ही खत्म हो जाएगी तो हम कहां से पैदावार करेंगे कहां से खाएंगे ये मेरा अपना दूध तो सूख गया जैसे तो फिर उधर का बाहर का पिला रही हूं डब्बे वाला दूध लैक्टोजिनो जैसे ना वो पिला रही हूं छोटी सी मुन्नी है मेरी इसे पिलाती हूं नहीं डॉक्टर ने तो मना किया था उन्होंने कहा था कि नहीं क्या नाम है इसका ये अभी आप जैसे और बच्चे करेंगी भी तो मसला बन जाएगा आपके साथ तो लेकिन मैंने अपने शौहर से बात की तो उन्होंने कहा कि भाई नहीं अल्लाह ताला की देन तो और तो इसमें कोई मसला नहीं तो हम जब एक तरफ ये खुश होते हैं कि हमारी आबादी का बहुत बड़ा हिस्सा जो है वो नौजवानों पर मुश्तमिल है और उसको हम अपना एसिड समझते हैं लेकिन वो एसिड जो अनस्किल एसिड है वो तालीम से महरूम है वो जाहिल है उसको معاشرے کی حقیقتوں کا اندازہ نہیں ہے اور جب وہ محرومی اور بھوک اور افلاس کا شکار ہوتا ہے تو پھر اس کا مطلب ہے کہ وہ معاشرے کے اندر ایک سوشل انریس کو کریٹ کرے گا وہ معاشرے کے اندر تضاد کو اگے بڑھائے گا کہ میں طوفان کو اپ نے روکا نہیں تو وہ جس طرح ہم کہتے ہیں ازا کہ سب چیز کھا جاتا ہے تو یہ سارا طوفان اپ کے سارے وسائل کو اپ کی ساری سوشل جو سٹرکچر ہے اس کو تباہ کر دے گا لٹی بٹلی وہ اپ کی اس معاشرے کے جتنا ڈیمیجنگ ہوگا کہ جس کو اپ ایسڈ سمجھ رہے ہیں وہ کل اپ کے لیے ایک لائبلٹی ایک ایک جو ہے اپ کے یہ بوجھ بن سکتا ہے بلکہ وہ بوجھ بنتا ہوا مجھے نظر بھی آ رہا ہے ساری صورتحال میں اس سے بھی زیادہ خطرناک بات شاید یہ ہوگی کہ ان پڑھ آبادی کی یہ بھیڑ اپنے دور کے مسائل کو حل کرنے کے قابل بھی نہ ہو बहुत प्यारा है अगले में वक्फा रखना पर कैसे आज ही अपने शहर के साथ सब सितारा क्लिनिक जाओ आज से 25 साल पहले पाकिस्तान की सबसे मशहूर कैंपेन फैमिली प्लानिंग की रोल आउट हुई ये हुकूमत पाकिस्तान के इनिशिएटिव था और इसकी लाइन तो बच्चे ही अच्छे तो पॉपुलर कल्चर का हिस्सा बन गए लेकिन हमने देखा 25 साल बाद सिचुएशन वैसी की वैसी है इनफैक्ट 25 साल बाद पॉपुलेशन आपकी दुगनी हो गई पेशेंट को ये कहते हैं कि आपको कम से कम 3 साल का वक्फा रखना चाहिए उसमें ये होता है कि बॉडी रिकवर हो जाती है जैसे अगर फौरन फौरन दोबारा प्रेगनेंसी हो जाए तो पेशेंट को काफी सारे कॉम्प्लिकेशंस हो जाती है जैसे कि फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल एनीमिया हो जाता है पेशेंट को रीनल फेलियर में चली जाती है पोस्टपार्टम हेमरेज हो जाता है पेशेंट को 
मेरा नाम किशोर है मेरी शादी को दस साल हो गए हैं मेरे छः बच्चे हैं और आखिरी बच्चे एक की पैदाइश के टाइम में मेरी मुझे बहुत मुश्किल हुई थी मुझे इसके वजह से मुझे डॉक्टर ने मना किया अगर अब मैं हामला हुई तो मेरी जान जा सकती है और इसी कमज़ोरी की वजह से मेरे एक बच्चे की फौजगी हो गई है अब मसला ये है कि आप लोगों से फैमिली प्लानिंग की जितनी भी बात कर लें वो सुनते नहीं हैं मगर अब चीज़ें बदल रही हैं जिनकी वो सुनते हैं अब उन्होंने भी इस पे बात करना शुरू कर दी है जैसे माँ जो है वो कमज़ोर है और वो जिसमानी तौर पर इस बात की अहल नहीं बीमारियों में मुबतला है उसकी जान को ख़तरा है उसकी सेहत को ख़तरा है या बच्चे जो छोटा बच्चा है जो उसकी गोद में है अगर उसकी सेहत ख़तरे में हो और ज़रूरत महसूस की जा रही हो कि वक्फा होना चाहिए तो इन